When on a first date, there's three topics which I feel is best avoided. The first one is politics. And all I'll say on that topic is if the red side and blue side could just learn to work together, maybe we could actually have some nice things in this country. Second is religion. Again, I'm going to try to avoid religion as a topic, but whether you're a worshipper of blue, yellow, red, steel, or purple deities, we can all put our differences aside and agree that green sucks because they have no god. The third and most controversial topic is playing decks over 60 cards. I can't even tell you how many failed relationships were caused by me playing a greater than 60 card list, but since I feel so close to my viewers here today, I'm here to confess that my secret kink is actually playing lists with 64 to 70 cards, mostly due to Mill. Coming from Magic the Gathering, I always played 60 card lists, as was the conventional wisdom, since playing more than 60 cards decreased the deck consistency and increased starting resource variation in terms of either mana flood or mana screw. But there are no lands in Lurkana since every inkable card is basically a land. We're not playing a combo deck where I really want to maximize my chances to assemble the pieces of Exodia. And every card in my deck is good because we're playing the overpowered red purple today. Anyways, I've been running a 64 to 67 card list with brooms just because I think brooms are kind of fun and I just wanted to test them out. So for those 60 card purists out there, just cut out the brooms and befuddle and Ursula and a crab or something from this list and you'll be good to go. And don't judge me too harshly for trying to have fun testing brooms in this video. Or just use the list piloted by Michael Ferrante in his recent big online tournament win featuring over 240 players, many of them strong ladder grandmasters. Anyways, now that that's out of the way, today we're going to talk a little bit about purple red and purple steel. I played a little bit of red purple at the start of the season, mostly messing around with the aggressive versions that run Pinocchio and Arthurs, but most of my season has been messing around with brews that focused on taking down red purple. And after getting beaten up day in and day out by red purple over a thousand games, one of the few decks that emerged which I had a positive win rate against red purple was purple steel. Which at its core level is an extremely similar deck with similar game plans, unless you're playing the mill version. A lot of players seem to have taken notice on Pixelborn Ladder, so now there's a noticeable metagame shift of people playing Purple Steel and having great results, and Steel in general is actually on the rise. Currently at the Grandmaster level, Purple Red, Steel Song, and Purple Steel are probably the three most widely played decks on Pixelborn, and I'll focus on the Purple Red versus Purple Steel matchup for this video, specifically the mid-range control variants of the builds. This means I won't focus on the aggressive red builds that play Pascal's Pinocchio's Arthur's or cover one of my favorite purple steel variants, Yzma Steel Wheel. So, both these decks have the same motive behind its builds. They just want to abuse the insane power level offered to them by the purple Mim Merlin package. The purple package dominates the board early and mid game, while also providing insane utility all throughout the late game by generating card advantage, character removal, and even lore with its bounce mechanisms. Naturally, players want a strong supporting color behind this core and have gravitated towards red and steel as they're the only colors with board wipes and also come with very strong removal. For its turn 1s, both decks typically play 4-8 to eight 1 drops to set up for turn 2 snake. Red plays its Olafs and minis, and steel has the option to play Captain Hooks, which die to Cindy Storm or Teeth, but it also allows for a turn to Pinocchio or pick a fight trades with opposing 1-3s. Otherwise, Steel will opt to run Tiana's and Olaf's themselves. On turn 2, ideally both decks want to drop Snake, bouncing their 1-drop. Red has a strong option of casting Teeth and Ambitions also on their 1-3 to try and kill off a character on the other side, particularly useful against Steel Song, which runs a lot of 1-cost 2 willpower characters. If Red misses its 1-drop, Typically, the deck will play pretty passively till turn 3, where it can play a Maleficent or Surfer Mini or Crab or something. This is typically why red-purple versions now try to run 6 or more 1-drops to create a more proactive early game to set up for a turn 2 Snake or Teeth. Steel, while missing out on the Teeth play on turn 2, has Prince Eryx, another very solid card in the metagame, having 3 willpower, which makes it survive Cindy Storm and Teeth, while being able to challenge and trade with the early game Mim Merlin package. For their turn 3s, Red wants to establish lore racing with Surfer Minis, or start building board and hand with Maleficent, and can also develop a Fox or Crab if the board calls for it. Steel has the same tools, but instead of a Surfer Mini, can play a more reactive Smash, which typically takes out the most important character drops developed until that turn. Steel also has its access to Baby Tinkerbell in this slot. 
On turn four, both decks would want to develop some rabbit or start building their hand, but can also use crabs or foxes or goats to contest the board. By the way, Merlin crabs are an excellent new development in the purple decks if you guys haven't been keeping up, as they allow red to find nice pickoffs with surfer minis in the mirror match, and allow steel to deal with the particularly difficult big Cindy using fox and crab combos. Anyways, on turn 4, while both decks can begin to tempo sing friends on the other side with their 3 drops at this point, Steel sometimes ekes out a bit of an edge at this point, as it can also sing out Storm Rage on or Strength of a Raging Fire if their builds runs those cards. On turn 5, Red has the incredibly powerful card Maui, which typically generates huge tempo swings and card advantage. Steel, however, has a huge game changer on turn 5 with Tragic Beast. Especially against Red Purple, Beast is sure to generate card advantage in some matter. So Red can't immediately deal with Beast as Lady Tremaine is typically blocked by other characters on the board, and Teeth and Ambition passively generates steel indirect card advantage, as by using Teeth and Ambition to hurt Emo Beast, Red has just one for zeroed themselves. Most Red Purple decks will have inked their Teeth and Ambitions, and if left unchecked, Tragic Beast will generate an overwhelming amount of card advantage before Red can clear the board with a beard prepared on turn 7. For this reason, Steel has been gaining an edge on Red in the Purple matchups, and I've also noticed a few Red players starting to include Dragonfire back into their lists, but they do also have access to Exert Pinocchios to deal with the Beast. On turn 6, Red unlocks Lady Tremaine, which isn't always useful versus Steel on this turn due to them being able to sacrifice a rabbit or something to it, but Steel unlocks Big Tinkerbell. And with all of Red Purple's early game typically having a willpower of 3, a turn 6 Tinkerbell with a beast singing swords will be a one-sided bee prepared and a huge tempo and lore swing for Steel. Beast's extra card advantage and a faster one-sided bee prepared from Steel is actually why Purple Steel decks have been performing quite well against Red. Both decks are going to be racing to 20 with endgame goat bounce and spellbook pokes in mind, and a lot of the match is certainly coin flip dependent as well. But early game red seems to race a bit faster with its surfer minis, but the mid game, particularly turns 4 through 6, is where Steel starts building card and board advantage and can swing the momentum around. Turn 7, of course, is the critical turn for Red to be prepared, but the 1-2 to two turn Steel has to shift a card and lore in its favor using Beast can usually be enough to win the race to 20 post be prepared. As long as Steel keeps an extra buffer character post be prepared for Lady Tremaine protection, it should be able to out-tempo the win against Red by a margin of a turn or so with Goats and Spellbooks and whatever other finisher of choice it wants, many lists preferring Elsa. But... And it's a big butt, literally. Enter Thick Booty Ursula. I was playing a lot of Purple Steel into Purple Red, and in particular, I started noticing that the lists I was losing to ran Ursulas. Ursulas are incredibly difficult for Steel to deal with, and performs extremely well into both Purple Steel and Steel Song. And in fact, I feel like Ursula swings the matchup massively into Red Purple's favor against Purple Steel. Steel's main removal source involves dealing direct damage, so imagine how difficult taking down an 8 toughness character is. Ursula also quests for a freaking 3 lore, and the set 2 metagame is all about tempo and lore racing, especially in Goat and Spellbook mirror matches. With lore racing in mind, she also subtracts 1 lore from the opponent, which actually ends up with a huge impact given how close many games are by a difference of 1 or 2 lore. This also allows Ursula to comfortably race in other matches like Flute Song. She can also sing Be Prepared in a format where tempo is king, and on top of all of that, she draws a card. She's Red's counter answer to Beast's card draw. With the surge of steel decks in the metagame and the importance of lore racing, Ursula comes in with huge board impact and might be one of Purple's top cards in its toolkit again. I decide to finally give Red Purple a spin with a build featuring 4 Ursulas. There's some sayings like, if you can't beat them, join them, and keep your friends close but your enemies closer. So for today, instead of playing my preferred Purple Steel, I'll be covering some games where I play the villain Red Purple with the Ursula list. So let's jump into some of these games. All the games I go over today will be against Purple Steel and against strong opponents, as I think these two decks have significant relevance in today's metagame. First game we're up against Blazin Asian, currently a top 25 ladder GM. Unfortunately we're going second which always sucks, and I think the coin flip in Lorcana is a very big deal which needs to be addressed, but that's probably a rant saved for another day. 
He inks a Tinkerbell and passes, so he could be on a number of things, but likely not Steel Song, as they don't really play Baby Tinkerbell these days. Since we have Snake Opener, we're definitely going to put out a mini for one lore. Every single lore matters in a purple versus purple matchup. He inks Beast and plays Eric. We haven't seen purple, but it's most likely purple steel. I ink Snake and play Snake after questing. We want to drop Surfer Mini on 3, and like I mentioned earlier, Red Purple generally gets ahead on lore early game because of her, but Steel can reverse the tempo around mid game with their earlier removal. He snakes his Eric after questing. I go ahead and drop my Surfer Mini on turn 3 in quest. He drops Rabbit on his turn 4 and trades his Snake for mine. It kinda sucks being the defender, which is why going first is so important, but here, since I had a 1 drop on turn 1 into stake, and he didn't, I gained a lore tempo on him, and with a surfer mini out, he has to play defense with his snake. I just quest and play a goat on my turn. He plays beast on turn 5 after singing friends with a rabbit. So on my turn 5, I have my first real decision. If I Maui his rabbit and swing in for 3 with goat and mini, this exposes me to a turn 6 board wipe in Tinkerbell and Sung Swords from Beast. I think typically it's better to hit the rabbit with the goat and cast friends or bounce goat back with a fox, even though it's less ink efficient than playing Maui. But I decided on the Maui line because I was semi gambling that he didn't have Tinkerbell. He inked a baby Tinkerbell on turn 1 which is a card you never ink unless you have a second baby Tinkerbell or a big Tinkerbell in hand. And since his turn 3 involved him dropping a snake and not a second baby Tinkerbell, I figured it was less likely that he had a big tank in hand. On his turn, he kills my goat with his beast, which may be surprising to some of you, but I don't mind his line. He already drew a card off beast, and he gained another by killing my goat, so even without a snake bounce on his beast, I think his line is good. Him presenting Snake and Rabbit on board is in anticipation for a be prepared on turn 7, and he needed to slow down my lore count from goat. On my turn, I drop Rabbit and Broom after singing Friends with Maui, and I return a goat back into my deck. He plays a Tinkerbell after singing Another Friends with Rabbit, and trades his snake for my Maui. So statistically, it's very likely he has a Swords in hand at this point. But him trading his snake for my Maui signaled to me that he didn't have a sword, as he could have wiped my board next turn using a sword. So I think the more conservative play here is to play out a Surfer Mini and also play Fox on my Rabbit to start building back my hand up to catch up on cards, and of course holding back Broom to not expose it to Tinkerbell. I made the read that he didn't have a Swords in hand, and I decided to go all in on the route to 20 and played Yzma on his Tinkerbell trying to close out the game before he could come back with his huge hand lead. Unfortunately, my Yzma drew him into Swords, and you can actually tell which card he drew on Pixelborn as he played his second rightmost card as Swords, which was the second card he drew from Yzma. He also sings a Storm Rage on to fully clear out my board, and plays out a Hook and Eric. I don't mind my Yzma line given my read that he didn't have swords, but I think it can be argued that playing the more conservative route of foxing back my rabbit could be a higher percentage route to victory. But I have a full set of 4 B prepares and 4 Ursulas in my deck, and I think drawing either should put me way ahead in the game despite my current hand size and board disparity, since I'm up 14 to 1 lore. I fox and rabbit to draw a couple cards, but I hit a bunch of bricks. I still decide to play out a 1-drop since I'm so close to finishing him off. I decide to get rid of his rabbit as I don't want him drawing more cards off bouncing it. On his turn, he Pinocchios my mini and kills off my fox and drops a key card in the matchup, Ursula. Crap. Now he can race with her super fast, and I don't have a B prepared, so the tables have turned extremely quickly here. I draw a Yzma, giving me a really difficult turn decision on whether to Yzma his Ursula or not, but I decide I'd rather play to my B prepared outs, so I play Rabbit, 
and draw a crab and play them onto the board. I'd also really like to use my, my own rabbit for be prepared chances the following turn. He very smartly recognizes that I don't have a be prepared and my best chance at drawing it is the rabbit. So he goes ahead and bounces Pinocchio with a fox and plays it to kill off my rabbit and then quests in. I draw an Ursula off the rabbit, and then I play her to finally find my be prepared. I quest in with crab. Now I do want to mention that it's possible by questing in with crab signals to him that I've drawn be prepared, and he could respond with an Ursula bounce on his turn if he reads into this. But I think he might still take that line on his turn regardless if he has bounce, so I think it's still my best line to quest. On his turn, he Yzmas my Ursula to prevent 3 lore, since I'm so close to lethal, and allows me to draw 2. He also smashes my crab, which I'm not sure I agree with, since statistically it's almost certain that I have a B prepared in hand by now, especially after drawing 2 off Yzma. And smash is probably better save for a post B prepared character from me, rather than saving 1 lore off crab. On my turn, of course, I be prepared and I play Surfer Mini on my turn. And finally, the game has equalized in lore, but I'm ahead now in board tempo and cards. He plays Rabbit and double storms my Surfer Mini. And because of this line, the game has now fully equalized, more or less. I go ahead and Lady Tremaine his Rabbit to regain board control, as it's going to be an extremely tight race 20 now. Now it's all about who draws the last finishing blows of goats or Ursulas or spellbooks. He plays another Ursula and Captain Hook, which is necessary to protect against a Tremaine in hand or a bounce Tremaine from board. Against Purple Red, it's really important that you guys keep a low ink drop character for Tremaine protection post be prepared. I decide to protect my Tremaine with my snake after questing and then clear the board with another be prepared. He finally finds his goat, and with Fox Bounce is able to play it twice. And although I still have 4 Ursulas and 4 goats left in my deck, since I shuffled one back in with Broom, I'm unable to find it in this critical spot, and the game ends soon after, as he finds a second goat from his deck to get his last lore points. Anyways, I thought this was a very good game highlighting the purple matchup dynamics from both decks and showing how big of an impact Ursula can have in the matchup. And the takeaway from this is um, maybe play a 60 card deck so you can draw your critical Ursula and Goats in the matchup. Also, since I went second that game, given how close the lore race ended up being, it might have all been decided by that first coin flip anyways. Okay, moving on to game two. In this game, I'm on the play and I don't know what my opponent is playing. With the teeth in hand and fox as well, I'm happy to play out my turn 1 mini. Also, I messed up and forgot to mulligan away my Yzma, so yeah. Don't be keeping her in your opening hand unless you're playing Yzma wheel and have baby Yzma plus wheel. He inks fox and plays Olaf, so he's likely to be on steel or red. I ink teeth and quest in with mini, as I can't really get punished unless he plays turn 2 queen of hearts. I feel like teeth is not great in a red purple matchup, and its primary use in holding it against a purple steel matchup is to poke at a 5 drop beast. He quests and snakes, and we still don't know his second color. I ink and play Maleficent, and would be happy to trade mini for a snake with my crab if he allows it. He finally reveals his second color on turn 3 as Steel and plays Baby Tinkerbell and Quests. On my turn I decide instead of Crab, I'll just rather bounce my Maleficent back to my hand as I'm lacking in card draw, and I trade my Fox for the Snake instead. My opponent draws with Tinkerbell, which is an interesting decision, but could be okay depending on the quality of his hand. I'm about to go to my turn 5, which opens baby Tinkerbell up to Maui, and even though I just used up a fox, it's still a possibility that I have another one. The crab play is much easier to miss though. 
I go ahead and take the crab value by beefing up my mini and killing his Tinkerbell. He has his turn 5 beast, and I try to balance out his beast card advantage with the Yzma cast on my mini mouse to draw two cards after questing. He plays a rabbit, which is one of the ideal plays on this board state before the critical be prepared turn. He then quests with beast in anticipation for be prepared. So reading an opponent for having a be prepared can be very tricky. Sometimes it's kind of easy to look at how they commit to the board state to see if the be prepared is coming. One issue with committing to the be prepared prediction line and questing in with beast though is what happens in this game. I actually top deck Maui, although I could have easily just have had one in hand. By committing beast to a quest, instead of be prepared, I can now Maui his beast and take out his Maleficent to gain a lopsided board advantage, as well as lore tempo. He develops a goat and Maleficent. I sing out friends with Maui and develop board and hand with my own Maleficent and play Spellbook and activate it. With the Spellbook out, a Bee Prepared in hand and a Goat and Fox in hand as well, I feel like this game is very well under my control. I'm racing to 20 and I'm probably one full turn tempo ahead of him. Again, something that could be significantly affected by me winning the coin flip at the start. He clears out most of my board with some fox and storm sequencing, trying to force a low value bee prep out of me. Instead of playing Be Prepared, I decide to trade off our Maleficence and develop a Lady Tremaine to clear his board of Rabbit. And she's an immediate 2 lore threat, which in addition to my spellbook, now puts me likely a full 2 or even 3 turns ahead for racing. He develops a Rabbit and Maleficent, but despite having a hand chock full of cards, He's too behind in the lore race and has not drawn an answer to Spellbook, so those cards won't end up mattering. I go ahead and quest and activate Spellbook, and then I use Goat and Fox to get myself to 16 lore. On his turn, he's able to clear my board with his Tinkerbell and Storm, but I have my B prepared I've been holding for the entire game. Instead, I draw into a Maleficent Dragon, so I play him instead to kill off the Tinkerbell while I present Lethal on board, as now he needs to immediately invest his entire turn resource to kill off the Dragon while Spellbook chips away at him. He has Elsa to answer and threaten a counter race, but of course, now I play the Be Prepared. I play Olaf, and while I've fully depleted all my resources in this game, and he's found huge card advantage through steel with 6 cards in hand, at 18 lore and a goat makes it all irrelevant, and I close the game out soon after. I didn't draw any of my 4 Ursulas this game, which if you look at the game state, you'd have realized she'd be an absolute blowout. The game ended up being kind of close and could probably be winnable from Steel's perspective. The Beast Questing and Tinkerbell activation lines could be called into question, but I don't think they were necessarily mistakes since we have incomplete information on what my opponent was holding at the time. But again, a big part of this was also I won the coin flip to go first, so I naturally started the game with a full turn tempo ahead. And given how tight these races are to 20, many times the coin flip on going first is all that ends up mattering. For our third game, we go second, and we're up against Colin So Fresh, who at the time of this recording is ranked number one on the new mini season reset on Pixelborn. He's been pumping out games with Purple Steel, 
but today he's on a 68 card version and possibly mill wheel variation. So he's a man after my own heart. We did actually match up earlier where I had a great game showcasing how insane Ursula and Bounce is against Purple Steel. But I didn't record that game, so unfortunately you guys are just stuck with this recording here instead. He opens with Blue Fairy and I open Olaf Snake. He foxes on his turn 3, and I have a Surfer Mini on my turn 3. Again, even though I went second this game, Surfer Mini, if not answered immediately, will catapult me way ahead in the lore race in this matchup. He sets up Storm Damage on my Mini, possibly setting up for a turn 5 Swords or turn 6 Tinkerbell, and plays Maleficent to dig. I quest and play out a rabbit and pass. He trades fox for snake and plays steel's patented turn 5 beast and quests in. On my turn I decide to sing a friends with mini as I'm about to 1 for 0 myself with the teeth on the beast to prevent the card draw. I take out Maleficent with rabbit and bounce it back to start gaining card advantage. My hand is full of uninkables, and I want to start drawing into ink so I can reliably land a turn 7 Ursula. This line opens me up to getting wiped out by a giant Tinkerbell, losing board and tempo, but I'm fine with that as I have a Tremaine for turn 6 setup, and I'm happy with my current card advantage against Steel. He does have the giant Tinkerbell and clears my board and quests in. I draw another Tremaine and play her to remove one of his two lore questers. I have no more ink in hand, but since most of my uninkables are in my hand, I'm optimistic that I'll draw into the critical 7th ink on my next turn. He plays Pick a Fight on his turn to take out Lady Tremaine, a card I really really like in this meta as a 1 or 2 of in steel to combat the rising popularity of green steel discard in the meta. He then plays a Blue Fairy. If he didn't play Blue Fairy, I would have actually just taken the Lady Tremaine value, but I draw a Surfer Mini and Inker and decide to plop down Ursula instead, and now he's in a world of hurt. He plays a second Tinkerbell and quests and passes. On my turn, I think I make my first major mistake of this series. I Maui his Tinkerbell and play Teeth hitting my Ursula and his Fairy. This may seem like a natural line at first glance, but against Steel and its direct damage spells, I think this is way too greedy. I think the better play would have been to actually sacrifice my Maui to my teeth to take out his fairy, preserving the damage count on my Ursula. This sequence would have been a fair card exchange, but since I'm so massively ahead in cards and soon lore, I should be satisfied with that trade. He just inked Strength of a Raging Fire, so it's possible he's running a Steel version with less copies of Smash, so it'd be very difficult for him to put 7 damage onto my Ursula on his turn. I get punished for my greed as he has a Storm Rage on on Ursula and kills her with Tinkerbell taking out my Maui in the process. He plays Fox, bouncing back his Tinkerbell to protect against Tremaine or Maui. I play Double Rabbit on my turn. It's more ink efficient than playing Lady Tremaine, and the Fox 1 lore isn't a big threat to me right now. On his turn, he plays another Pick a Fight to kill a Rabbit and drops a Jafar. All he has left in hand is one card, and it's a Tinkerbell. I Maui his Fox and play Spellbook, putting him on a Death Clock. He trades his Jafar into Maui trying to dig for something, but realizes that in this game state, he's probably lost, and soon concedes afterwards. Aside from his turn 5 beast that immediately got teeth, he was unable to find the critical rabbits in the matchup to fill up his gas tank to compete in the race, and that's just sort of how some purple matches go. 
Anyways, that first Purple Steel game I showed in this video is actually my only loss to Purple Steel with the deck so far, and my opponent's version was also running Ursula. I think Ursula is going to start appearing in a lot more purple deck lists. So whether you're playing purple yourself or if you're playing steel, I would definitely keep her on my radar in consideration when building your deck lists. Anyways, thanks for watching my video.